Well, thank you everyone so much for attending the webinar today. Um, you should be able to see a cover slide on your screen at this point. Uh, my name is Kate Valenti. I'm the Senior Director of Integration Services at Unicon. Today I'm joined by Lou Harrison of North Carolina State University and Josh Barron of Marist College. I had the pleasure of working with Lou and the NC State team and Josh and the Marist team along with my colleagues from Unicon to deliver the first phase of NC State's analytics project work. And today you're going to hear about that project, how it fits into NC State's path to Im implementing enterprise learning analytics on their campus. Before we launch into our webinar, I just wanted to provide a brief mention of Unicon for those of you who may not be familiar. We're an IT consultancy focused in the education space. Uh, we offer services across the technology spectrum ranging anywhere from software development to system integration, uh, identity and access management to um, even learning analytics appropriately enough. So that's our spotlight today um, and, and I'm going to move us forward uh, without further ado. So just to give you a view of what we're going to be talking about, Josh is going to start us off with a bit of historical and community context around the technology and the predictive modeling that provides the foundation for the work that uh, was done and will be done at NC State. We'll then hand it over to Lou, who will talk about NC State's Enterprise Learning Analytics journey, which is really the bulk of our presentation today. And then after that, we'll open it up for Q&A. Um, so some administrative um, details here. There's a chat window available for you in the Adobe Connect se session. If you have questions, please feel free to ask them anytime throughout the presentation and we'll queue them up and address them at the end during Q&A. We do, do hope to get some really good meaty learning analytics, analytic implementation questions, so please, please don't be shy. Please throw your questions out there. And with that, I will hand the floor to Josh. Thanks a lot, Kate, and uh, I'll just start off by thanking you not just for uh, helping organize, facilitate the uh, web conference here, but uh, for also playing a huge leadership role in the work that's happening in the open learning analytics space. Um, I think Unicon has been a great partner to work with uh, in the community and um, really appreciate all the support you guys give. So yeah, so I'm going to very briefly here talk about some historical context, and I'll begin by giving a little overview of a prior project that some of you may be familiar with already the Open Academic Analytics Initiative that Maris led a few years ago. A lot of the work happening at NC State is kind of building on top of this project, so having some historical context I think will be helpful uh, as we hear from Lou. And then I'll also briefly uh, touch on uh, some of the work happening in the Aperio Learning Analytics Initiative. So why don't we go to the next slide and talk a bit about this uh, OAI project. So this began uh, three or four years ago. It's a, it was an EDUCAUSE NGLC, or Next Generation Learning Challenges uh, program. It was funded primarily by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. We had about a quarter of a million dollars over really became uh, almost a, a two-year period. And we had a couple of major goals we were working under. Uh, one was to develop really the world's first, as far as I know, kind of prototype open source academic early alert system that would allow us to predict which students in specific courses were at risk to not complete those courses successfully, and then, of course, uh, provide some interventions with those students to help turn things around and make them successful. Uh, at the same time, uh, we were uh, researching two major what we call scaling factors uh, in terms of bringing this kind of technology to higher education in general. So one of those was simply around the intervention strategies themselves. So we were looking at two different intervention strategies and exploring which one might work better than the other. Uh, and we are also researching a topic that uh, I think remains relatively new around portability of predictive models. So if you build a predictive model based on data from one type of institution, let's say a uh, four-year private liberal arts institution like Marist College, how, will the, how well will that um, model perform when you go and and implement it and deploy it at a very different type of institution, let's say like NC State, which is obviously a, a large public research institution. So we go to the next slide, I'll briefly overview how we kind of approach this, this project. Um, I'm not seeing the next slide, so we can go to the next slide. There we go. So very high level overview here, but we started out by bringing together a large amount of historical data. Again, this was data from Marist College and our students here. There was two primary kind of data sets we were working with. One was uh, student aptitude and demographic data, things like SAT scores, high school GPA, cumulative GPA at the moment, age, gender, so forth 
mostly coming from our student information system. The other data set was learning management system data, so we were working with event log data, all the things students are clicking on in the LMS, as well as gradebook data. Um, I should mention, and Lou will talk uh, here in a minute, that we're now really kind of LMS agnostic in our work, so although we started with Sakai, NC State's implementing this around Moodle, for example. So once we brought together several semesters of this data, we used kind of sophisticated machine learning algorithms to mine this data, looking for patterns correlating the data that we had with student success in, in courses, which was really uh, looking at their final grade. Once we found those patterns, we used those to pre uh, create a predictive model. And then as the semester is going on, we're feeding this data in kind of near real time into the predictive model. Scoring process takes place to identify the students who are at risk to not complete the course successfully. That gets sent to the instructor in the form of what we call an academic alert report. And then the instructor deploys one of these two different interventions, either what we call an awareness intervention or uh, an online academic support environment intervention. If we go to the next slide, we'll, I'll share some of the results with folks. So, this was a fairly large uh, scale study. We uh, rolled this prototype system and that predictive model out to about 2,200 students across four institutions over two semesters. Uh, these were two community colleges, uh, Cerritos College and Redwoods College, and two historically black college universities, um, Savannah State University and uh, North Carolina A&T. And we had, a, I think, a pretty rigorous research design where we had a uh, one instructor teaching three sections of the same course so that we could control for confounding variables. One section acted as a control group, did not receive any interventions. The other two sections received one of the two interventions that we were, that we were studying. Uh, and we ran these predictions uh, kind of uh, three times during the semester, 25% into the course, which is, again, in this kind of pretty early period of two to three, three weeks into a regular semester course, and then 50% and 75%. And those were kind of arbitrary and just a way of standardizing things for our research purposes. The next two slides, I believe, will kind of show some of the results. So let's move on to there. Um, so in terms of portability, uh, we actually went into this um, assuming that the predictive models would not be very portable, meaning that the model would not perform particularly well when we moved it from Marist to, let's say, a community college. As you can see, if you look at that accuracy column kind of towards the middle, that the accuracy of the predictions were actually pretty good. We were thinking they might be 30, 40 percent, and they turned out to be the 60, 70 percent range. Um, so this was kind of an exciting finding for us at the time. It made us feel like the models were, were more portable than we thought, and led to this idea of a tuning process where we could take a somewhat generic model like we've built use local data from a, any particular institution and tune that model to boost its performance for that specific uh, student population and institution type. Um, and that's some of the work that, that we're now doing, which is leading to uh, our goal, which is to create a large global library of open predictive models. All the models that we've developed have been released under an open license. And so the idea is to have a library of models that institutions can kind of pull off the shelf, tune, and then deploy at their own institution. Go to the next slide, we'll see some results from the intervention study. Um, this is just one. I picked one here to, to highlight. We did have some statistically significant findings. In this case, we're looking at impact of the interventions we had on final course grades. And we found there was a definitely significant, statistically significant impact there. Uh, you will notice that it didn't seem to matter which intervention was used. The impact was very similar between the two. But both had a, a, a impact on final grades, which I think shows how this technology can really address issues of course completion, uh, graduation rates, and so forth, the student success challenges that I think all of us in higher education are familiar with and, and are working on. We go on here. Um, I've skipped over uh, <laughs> about 12 months of, of a bunch of graduate students and faculty members here of research, uh, which they, you know, very extensive. And so if you want to go and take a look at more of the findings and get a really comprehensive overview of that prior project, we published a big paper in the Journal of Learning Analytics, which is an open access journal. So you can go there and take a look at it. Uh, we will be making the slides available in follow-up. So let me kind of wrap up before I turn it over to Lou and just kind of um, talk a little bit about some of the work that's going on in a larger kind of 
uh, global open learning analytics community, and I'll speak specifically about the Aperio Learning Analytics Initiative. When we go to the next slide there, we'll see some of the work that's happening. And so if you're not familiar with Aperio, uh, you can think about it as kind of a, the Apache Foundation for Higher Education. So Aperio is a nonprofit uh, higher education open source uh, foundation that kind of supports and facilitates open source projects across higher ed. Um, and so uh, as the work that Maris was doing was kind of coming to an end, we began to speak to our colleagues across the Perio community and realized that there was a number of other projects happening in the learning analytics space, again, in the open learning analytics space, that really could come together to kind of form a modular-based platform or open platform for learning analytics. And that was really kind of the impetus to create the Learning Analytics Initiative, which is really trying to take the cutting edge research coming out of the learning analytics research communities and use it, uh, you know, build that into real production ready software that can be used in this kind of platform. There's currently four major institutions and partners, organizations that are kind of helping lead this initiative, uh, Maris being one of them, Unicon, uh, University of Amsterdam, and Uniform Service University. And you'll see the names of some of the projects that each group is kind of focused on right now. Some of these are in incubation with Aperio, meaning they're kind of being matured, uh, and some in the Student Success Plan, which is a kind of intervention system, is uh, left incubation and is now an Aperio kind of um, endorse project. So if we go to the next slide, pause here while I get my screensaver back up. There we go. So this is just a high-level picture of what this platform is kind of uh, working towards doing. And so conceptually, we were building and have capabilities to collect learning analytics data and activity data from many sources, bringing that in a common uh, storage uh, uh, capability or, or system. We have a learning uh, data analysis kind of component, which is really focused on uh, kind of the, the brains of the system, doing the heavy lifting around the big data uh, analytics. And the results of that can then be pushed out to communication systems like dashboards and uh, intervention systems uh, where action can be taken. And if you can, if you can hit the next uh, buttons there to bring up the, um, the, you can see how the other, the projects on the prior side, I mentioned things like the learning analytics processor, open dashboard, uh, kind of fit into each one of those more generic boxes. And then at the bottom, you see that, again, we we're building out this library of open models uh, for people to kind of take advantage of and, and, and enhance and hopefully share back. Uh, if we go to the, the, I think, two last slides here quickly, I'll hit, um, turn it over to Lou. I think one, one of the things that we're really excited about is um, a, a project that's just recently gotten started with the JISC, which is a nonprofit higher education um, tax uh, government funded group in the UK that provides technology services to all UK higher ed. They've uh, decided to adopt the uh, the open framework to a large extent that I've just gone over and are now funding a project uh, with uh, Unicon and Marist are involved in them along others that is going to develop this into a um, highly scalable cloud ready kind of platform that can be provided as a service out to all the UK institutions who want to take advantage of it. And you'll see right in the center there is a learning analytics processor, for example. And so again, it's great to see them uh, the, the model we've been working on resonating kind of more globally and being adopted there. There's a link there you can follow if you want to take a closer look at some of the GISC work. Last slide, I'll just highlight an opportunity in case there's interest and you happen to be uh, traveling over to the University of Edinburgh, maybe at the end of April, the Learning Analytics Knowledge Conference or LAC Conference, which is really the largest gathering of both researchers and open source uh, software developers working in this open learning analytics space is going to be um, holding a hackathon that's going to be co-sponsored by JISC and Aperio to kind of uh, work with the data and platform that we're developing with the JISC and allow people to kind of do some hacking and experimental stuff with, with that system. So I so thought I'd just highlight that if there was interest. So with that, I'll turn it over to uh, Lou to kind of, oh, I'm sorry, one last slide. And again, we'll make these available to folks to uh, to, to get access to, but if you want to learn more about the Aperio LAI or Learning Analytics Initiative, there's a, a wiki, GitHub, and a mailing list. Um, probably the mailing list is the best way to stay posted and uh, familiar with what's happening in that community. And with that, now I think I'll turn it over to Lou to really <laughs> talk about the kind of more exciting stuff about what, what he's doing there at, at NC State. Thank Thanks, you, Josh. Josh. Let me, uh... All right, so uh, thanks, thanks, Kate. Thanks, Josh. Um, 
I, I, I'm going to later on. I think there's a, a little teaser at the end of this talk for a, a talk that, that that we're doing at, at Educause in October uh, that seems to have a similar uh, title to this, perhaps, and and some of the same speakers. And I wanted to say that there is some similarity between the two talks, but there's definitely some differences as well. Um, I think that that's set up more like a panel, and it's going to have. Uh, um, more more dialogue, I would think, especially since everyone's going to be in the same room. Uh, and this one, I think, has a little more a little a little more depth, a little more detail. So, um, I, I'm going I'm I'm not going to talk about statistics and 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 p values and things like that. That's that's really not my thing. I'm gonna I'm gonna start by uh, talking about how we're um, as a campus getting to where we we have. Uh, something in place, and and uh, I wish I wish I could uh, uh, come to you and and say this is uh, this is fabulous, and everything has been working swimmingly, and we all have a we're all of like mind. Uh, truth is, we're not, and it, it's uh, it, it's uh, a challenge to to get everybody on the same page. But I think that there's probably value in in, in hearing <laughs> hearing about the road. So uh, so that's the approach that I'm going to take. Um, so, so several years ago, uh, uh, our campus went through a strategic planning process, and since that time, every sort of level of organization down the chain from the university as a whole has gone through some strategic planning uh, process. And, and as you might expect, um, goal one for strategic planning at pretty much every level across the board has to do with student success. Um, of course, at the university level, it's very you know broad based and, and generic. And uh, down at my level, where where I am in the uh, educational technology division of Delta, which is a, a, a technology and distance education division at, at NC State, we're more focused on leveraging the technology itself to improve student success. Um, and and so you can you can see where uh, where where the fit is with uh, uh, with things like uh, LAP and OAAI. Um, so we've we've had a lot of uh, a lot of dialoguing on campus. Um, my boss and one of our associate registrars put together a bunch of talks and said, "Well, let's have some lunch and learn sessions and see what's going on in the learning analytics space." And um, we had a bunch of people in. We had some, some folks who were doing sort of small pockets of things on campus. We had some vendors come in. Um, and as part of all of that, we had uh, Josh come down. I had met Josh uh, at Educause, I think, the year before. But uh, in December of last year, Josh and uh, Sandeep came down from Marist and talked to the campus about what's, what's going on with, uh, uh, with, with LAP. Um, so we had all these things, and we sat down and we talked, and then we we had sort of a summative lunch and learn where people uh, sat in a room and talked about all of those all of those talks that we'd been to, and and we all we all agree helping students succeed is a good thing. I don't think anyone would disagree with that, um, but we don't always necessarily agree with with how to do so. Um, as I said, the, one of the reasons why Josh and Sandy came down is because I had been in touch with them since a presentation he gave the year before at Educause about OAAI. Um, there are other people in the registrar's office in uh, um, uh, academic affairs who have different thoughts about things and are exploring different options as well. Um, nothing wrong with options, right? Um, so what do we do? We have a whole bunch of people in different quarters of the university working on a whole bunch of different types of things. And um, I, I can't tell you today that I have a good answer for what is the best path. Um, we've got a bunch of different tools that are being explored currently. We have um, uh, a bunch of unanswered questions, and we have some questions that uh, that I think we know how to answer. Uh, so uh, I'm going to talk mostly about the things we want to know and that, and how we want to answer those things. So uh, there. Uh, so uh, Delta, which I said is the group that I'm in, we wanted to experiment at least with LAP. Um, 
I have this terribly bad habit of calling it OAI because that's how I was introduced to it. Um, but uh, uh, we have been working with Josh uh, and Sandeep. Oh, hello. Sorry about that. Uh, we've been working with Josh and Sandeep and the folks at Unicon to figure out what it means to implement LAP on my campus. So I got some funding last year, um, and the plan was for us to spend a little time with some old data. We we did some some uh, gathering of data and um, and see what happens. Right? That that was that was phase one. That's uh, that was the start. Uh, I I will say, let me just pause here and say, uh, one of the reasons why we liked OAI or LAP better than a lot of the other things that we look, had looked at uh, for uh, learner analytics was that it's, it's truly predictive. Um, a lot of the things that we looked at, a lot of the technologies we've seen, a lot of the technologies that people are trying to sell me, um, aren't really predictive. What they do is uh, let you adjust a whole bunch of knobs for your class, and then if somebody dips below some threshold, you get a warning message. And we, we really didn't like that approach, mainly because it requires some measure of work by the faculty. And, and historically, that kind of thing has been problematic, trying to get a faculty member to set a knob or a, in, on a lot of these things, a bunch of knobs to know when students are having a problem in their classes is, is, is traditionally been um, fraught with peril in our experience. So we were looking for something that would be um, sort of hands off by the faculty, at least in the predictive phase, uh, and just do its thing. And this uh, seems like that. Another very nice thing about it that, that I feel is different than a lot of the other things we looked at is that the the math is um, is available should you understand the math. You can actually look under the hood and and have your statisticians look under the hood. Uh, it seemed to me many of the solutions that we looked at, even when they claimed to be predictive, were magic eight ball type solutions, and not exactly sure how they work, and they're not keen to tell you. So, um, so that's some of the reasons why we went with uh, we went forward with this. And, and as I said, there's some other stuff on campus going on as well in slightly different spaces. But uh, so, got money. We worked worked on phase one, and um, and we spent some time while we were ramping up phase one, talking about what phase two would look like as well. Uh, Phase, phase one was very uh, hands-on, right? So we, we spent a lot of time massaging data and sending data to Sandeep up at, up at uh, Marist to work on, and we spent a fair amount of time mapping things. We decided that if we're going to continue to do this, it has to be better. So we, we, we again, started thinking how we're going to make it bigger, better, more enterprise-y. Um, so uh, as, as I said, uh, we, we spent a fair amount of time doing crosswalks. Uh, LAP was originally designed for uh, Sakai as an LMS. Um, NC State uses Moodle. Uh, I don't believe any of the schools that were involved in the OAI implementation um, used PeopleSoft as their SIS. We do. Uh, so we, we had a fair amount of time invested in phase one and figuring out what, you know, uh, GPA in our, our system looks like and how do we get it to a format that the model is happy with or change the model and so on and so on. There are a lot, a lot of different um, fields and some of them are numbers and they're the same regardless, but some of them are, um, are not and we, need, we needed to make some, some sort of mapping. So there was a, a relatively large amount of phase one was doing that. I believe, and uh, um, so we did that. We spent some time. We built this crosswalk. Uh, we sent a bunch of data. I, w I will mention for anyone who might be concerned out there, it was all sanitized data. We didn't send anybody's names or social security numbers, but we sent data up to Sandeep at Marist, and he did he did the, the model fitting and tuning, and 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 ran. And again, this was all historical data uh, from a previous semester, so we knew the outcome. So it's very 
easy to tell if you got it right or not. So, so, so just briefly, some, some results here. The predictive power, there are a bunch of different things. That the top things were a grade book, which is in the LMS, cumulative GPA, which is not. It's demographic data from SIS, and academic standing, which is also uh, demographic data from SIS. Uh, and then, uh, course logins, content access, whether the course is online or not, which are all in the LMS. So you can see there's a, a good mix of predictors high on that list there, some of which are uh, demographic data and come from SIS, and you don't care what the LMS you're using is, and some of them come directly from the LMS as well. And uh, drum roll. First pass, uh, not a heck of a lot of tuning, uh, relatively small sample size, but we were getting really, really good accuracy, 75 to 77%, uh, really good recall rates. Uh, Sandeep noted that it was the highest that they saw anywhere but Marist, and the, the initial model was designed for Marist. So. Um, the, the one thing that I think gave uh, Sandeep pause was that the uh, the false alarms, the false positives, were a little bit high in the in the 25% range. Uh, although personally, my philosophy is I would rather have that high and have the accuracy high. Um, I'd rather warn some people that they might be at risk that aren't than the opposite. If if you understand what I'm saying. Um, okay, so that was. Phase one, we wrapped that up in May. Now, what, what are we? Uh, what are we on to next? So, if, if you if you recall from when when Josh was speaking earlier, um, when when they originally did the research, they did relatively small sample sizes. They did predictions at a quarter of the way through a course, halfway through the course, three quarters of the way through the course, and 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 it was a multi-step manual process to, to, to crunch the numbers, essentially. And for us in phase one, all of that was true. It was uh, uh, all multi-step and manual. So phase two goals, here we go. This is the, the big stuff. We wanted large sample sizes, right? All of my students and all of my students' enrollments, we have a, just under 40,000 students. Each of them is taking you know, three, four, five courses. It's a lot of enrollment, so it's a big, big sample size. And for each of those, there's just scandalous numbers of log files from the LMS. The demographic data is relatively small per student, but there's a ton of log files uh, that we have to process. Um, we would like our runs to be frequent and early in the semester, not you know, like in the research at a, a quarter or half and three quarters. Our, our philosophy is we actually want to do all the runs early in the semester when we can intervene and make a difference. Uh, and so it's not clear exactly how far into the semester we're going to have to go, but um, uh, that's our goal anyway. Early, early as possible, no one is a problem. And to make an automatic, more enterprisey system where you don't have to move stuff from one system to another. You just click or set up a cron job, and it just happens. Um, so this is this is what we're working on, right? We're working with... Uh, with, with Unicon and with Maris to, and this is similar to the, the slide that Josh showed you um, about the JISC, uh, and, and we're very happy that, uh, that everyone's working with JISC too, because I think they're actually paying for some of the stuff that I need, and I think I'm paying for some of the stuff that they need. It's, uh, uh, it's not like we're all in one big partnership, but it's symbiotic at least. Uh, so we want to be able to rebuild this whole predictive model infrastructure so that it will work at the scale we need it to work at. Um, currently, this fall, this semester that started uh, you know, five weeks ago, we've been taking snapshots on a regular basis at the beginning of the semester of all of the data every day. So we know what you know day three of the fall semester looks like. We know what day seven of the fall semester looks like from the perspective of the data we need to, to run the analytic engine. Um, our goal is when we're, when we're done with this infrastructure rebuild and we have a way to very easily run it for any given time period, we're going to go back um, and run it on day one of the semester, run it on day five of the semester, whatever, something like that, and then see um, since it's after the semester and we actually know how the students did, we can see the sweet spot, right? Maybe. Maybe we find out that two and a half weeks into the semester is when you can actually really start to, start to get a good 
uh, predictor of, of student success in a class. Maybe it's as late as four weeks. I don't know. I don't know exactly where it's going to land, but I think having all of these snapshots and the ability to go back in time, essentially, um, will afford us that uh, insight. I think it's a really interesting thing uh, to do. So uh, other things that we want to do is uh, refine the model. Uh, right now we've got a model, a single model that Sandeep developed for us. I think that as part of phase two, we're making it better. And it also as part of phase two, we're going to build um, – different cohort models, right? So instead of having a model that's for everybody at NC State, maybe we have a model for engineering students and a model for humanities students and a model for vet med students and so on and so forth. Different models based on the different types of students that we see. Um, and maybe it's maybe we don't do that. It's not clear to me how much benefit there is. But again, since we have this snapshot data from every day, we can actually go back in time and compare the, a, a cohort-based model with you know three cohorts or fifteen cohorts or whatever we uh, decide to build models for, um, and compare the success rate of prediction against just the single model. And and maybe it turns out that a single model um, is almost as good as a whole bunch of segmented models, and it's not worth the additional cost of maintaining all of those models. Or maybe it is worth the additional cost of maintaining all of those models, or maybe we have a happy medium where we have you know, three or four models instead of a whole bunch. Uh, I, don't, this, this is, I find this very exciting because we don't really know the answer to any of these questions right now, but, uh, but we're gearing ourselves up to be able to ask them and, and learn. So. So again, um, we also want to be able to, once we sort of establish, you know, whether we're going to have one model or three models or ten models or fifteen or whatever, um, how we we want to establish how we refine those models every year or every semester and make them as good as they can be. Um, we want to explore very different ways to track uh, our effic efficacy over time. And see if uh, if if the predictive value is good or or, or not good or, or or whatever. And um, I guess I will I will leave this with uh, uh, just saying that you know one of the concerns that I that I have is you know once we start doing things to affect the the, the outcomes you know the success of the students which is because right now we're not telling students anything about these models. We're just doing the, the, the runs historically. But once we actually start using the data from these models and telling students, hey, you're at risk and, 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 and you know, helping them to be uh, not so at risk, we, we really can't ever go back to, to where we were. And so, so we, I think we have to be careful uh, and, and vigilant that the, the models don't you know, drift or the, maybe the population dynamics change and the models become less effective. So a little, little concerned about that. I don't think that's a, a big concern for the, for the near future, but I think it's something we've got to keep in our heads. Um, before we hop back to Kate, I, I do want to say uh, I started earlier and, and mentioned that, uh, um, that we're, we're focused on this particular aspect uh, of the prediction. I mean, my, my goal is to, to use all the data that I, that I have in the LIP processor to get a number that says how likely it is a, a, a student's going to pass or fail uh, a given class at any, at any day throughout the semester. Um, it's not yet 100% clear to me what's going to happen with that data. It's, it's, I, I will say that's out of my purview. Uh, the conversations are starting on Canvas. I mean, obviously, there's going to have to be some remediation, right? Some, somebody's going to have to do something, and uh, uh, that's clear. And everyone agrees that that's clear, but it's not all clear how that happens, whether you know, the faculty member gets a report that says these students are in trouble or the student's advisor gets a report. It, I know a lot of people tell the students themselves that they're having problems. Some, some places have a different philosophy about that. A lot of different places we can go. Um, and we don't really have a good answer for that right now, um, which is 
unfortunate, but uh, we still have some time. And and I think that the people who are responsible for sort of that piece of the world, academic affairs and so on, are definitely talking about what they want to do. And I think we're we're helping guide them in that in that conversation. Uh, but that's that. I, I I just want to be clear. That's a little bit beyond my. Uh, my purview, right? It's not not really my bailiwick. Uh, my my goal is to get them a number, and then and hopefully they take that number and they do good stuff with it. All right, thanks so much. Uh, we do have some questions that are starting to queue up. I wanted to mention, uh, as as Lou talked about at the beginning, um, there is a panel discussion happening at Educause. If you happen to be going at the end of October in Indianapolis, that uh, Josh and Lou and other colleagues that you'll see here will be presenting. Uh, we've posted the information here. It's, it's Thursday and it's an afternoon session. Um, so if you ha happen to be attending Educause and want to learn more, um, that will be a, you know, a slightly different slant on this conversation. Might be a good opportunity to ask some, other, some questions of some other folks who are involved. Um, I also do want to mention Unicon will be in the exhibit hall. We're in booth 939, so we'd love to have you stop by. Um, there will be an opportunity to speak with Josh in Unicon's booth after that discussion, and maybe if we're lucky, Lou might even stop by. So it'll be a great opportunity to connect if you have further questions. And that said, we'd love to take questions now. So we're going to go ahead and open it up. Um, we do have some in the chat already. Yeah, okay. yeah I see, I see Paul. Paul Paul's an overachiever, apparently. Yeah, um, so thank you, Paul. Uh, <laughs> yeah, so uh, so, we're just going to start at the top. Um, Lou, if you could address to what yeah. extent you've had to prime the pump with answers to commonly asked questions to get conversations started among your colleagues. I, I think that's, that's a really good question, and, and I think we, we, we did and we continue to do that all the time. I think part of the, um, the goal of those Lunch and Learns was to, to get people – not so much thinking about answers, but thinking about the questions that had to be asked. So I, I we, we we did uh, an awful lot of that. I don't um, I don't think it's over yet. Uh, like I said, the, the, there are folks who are starting to talk about uh, how you remediate what what you might do. Um, I think that they probably need some more help, uh, uh, some facilitation, if you will, to think about what the issues are. I the, the, as far as um, uh, this project it is very similar to a lot of other things that we do that are for, for on the surface technology projects it turns out that the technology while sometimes difficult to handle is 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 frequently uh, still much much easier than than the politics and the policies and the governance uh, so so we we actually spend a fair amount of time on all of those things trying to make it happen so um, I'm going to hop down to the next one it's um you know, it's a great question what the footprint is. It's not 100% clear because we don't have it up and running yet. That's part of phase two. It's not going to, it's not going to be a super huge uh, um, machine. It's, uh, it's going to be a VM. We're going to host it. We have, we have our own data center. Um, and um, part of what we're doing in phase two and part of what they're doing with JISC is building on um, different architecture that's designed for big data, uh, Hadoop and, and, uh, and, and Kettle and things like that, uh, that are designed for that. So they're, 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 they're more efficient than, the, the, than a uh, relational uh, database might be for, for that stuff. Um, I think we're, we're talking about a, a couple of uh, relatively small VMs, fair amount, fair amount of disk space for all the logs and, and all the data and stuff like that, and, and, and a reasonable amount of memory. Um, I think we'll know more um, come January or February exactly. Uh, keep in mind, though, that uh, um, it, while we're striving for it to be more efficient, it doesn't have to be like crazy efficient, okay? Because um, my goal is to run it at most once a day. So if I start it early one morning and it finishes by the end of the, you know, the end of the day, I'm happy. So it can take a fairly fairly long time to process those 40,000 students and all of their enrollments. It just needs to finish within you know 24 hours. Um, so uh, how has it? I'm reading down. How has it been received by faculty, staff, yeah, and so, students? Go so on. Lou, just just in case folks aren't uh, watching the chat, I'll just uh, I'll read this one out and then sure. you can. 
can address it. So the next question is, how has this been received by faculty, staff, and students? Yeah, and uh, also also a good question, and also I think a little bit premature, at least on the on the terms of faculty and and students. We've mostly been working with other staff members. We've been working with people in in the registrar's office. We've been working with people in uh, in our central IT division. We've been working with people in uh, academic affairs, and and they it, all of us. And and uh, I don't remember the name. There's a, there's a um, there's another division of the university that just recently changed their name that's basically in charge of all of the big data, that, uh, uh, data warehousing type stuff. Uh, everybody understands and, and, and recognizes the need for something like this. It, it, we, we all maybe argue about what the best way to do it is. Uh, we're focused on this because it's uh, inside a course and, and we want to be able to do something uh, within a course before it's too late, they've got some other tools that they're looking at that are outside of the course that just use demographic data to try and assess how well a student's doing. I think that uh, ultimately we're, our hope is that our system talks to their system, their system talks to our system. Um, it's a, I, I'm not sure yet how faculty and or students will receive this. Uh, so it's a, it's, it's a fine question. Maybe, maybe, uh, maybe we'll do a webinar next year and we'll have more information about that. I, I, this is Josh. I could just briefly comment there because we, uh, we, in terms of the original work we did with the uh, Gates uh, Foundation funding, you know, there we were. You know, we've we've had that experience working with 2,200 students, and I'd say that the response was was more positive than we were expecting. Meaning that you know, when you're dealing with confidential private data, there's always a big brother concern. Uh, so we really weren't sure what the response was going to be. To give you one kind of data point, we uh, we were doing this as a uh, kind of a official research study, so we had to give students, uh, we, we did informed and con consent, we had to let them opt out of the study if they wanted to. We thought we could get as much as 20 or 30 percent of the students opting out. Of the 2,200, we had five, not five percent, but five total students opt out. And that was surprising to us when we kind of interviewed them a bit. What we found was that, um, first of all, they, they do kind of assume we're already tracking in this data and doing this type of thing. Uh, but they were also very comfortable uh, with us doing this, provided they got this great benefit back from their view of uh, getting some extra help and being alerted when, when maybe they're struggling. And on the faculty side, the kind of general comments were around uh, efficiency of their time. They're very busy. A lot of the community college instructors were, were teaching hundreds of students, and they care about their students greatly, but they're, they're just limited in time and knowing Okay, this week here are the five students that really need an intervention uh, was, was something they found to be really uh, compelling. Great. Thank you, Josh. And, and thank you, Paul, for kicking us off with those great questions. And looks like we'll see you at Educause. So looking forward to more questions. Um, UCLA, Jim at UCLA poses a question uh, around standards. So since the existing data sources provide significant amounts of data, are there plans to incorporate further detailed data um, using standards such as uh, Caliper, XAPI. Um, Lou, if you want to comment on future plans around this, um, that'd be great. We also do have Gary Gilbert on the line. Gary's the architect from Unicon who was involved in implementation, and, and Gary could comment on this as well. So, Lou, Lou you tell me what you want to do. Yeah, I think that's a Gary question. Okay. <laughs> All right, I'll, 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 I'll do my best to, uh, to stand in for Lou. Um, so hi everybody, this is Gary. Um, yeah, so the short answer to the question is uh, yes, um, we support uh, XAPI today. Uh, we support a number of other standards, LTI, um, and we're, we're uh, building support for Caliper. Um, we're, we're, we're early in that process, but uh, it's definitely on the roadmap. Thanks, Gary. Um, from Portland, we have a question on how have student services or development practitioners responded? Um, if, if we can comment on that at this point, has their work changed? Yeah, I, I, I'm sure Josh can based on the previous stuff, but I, yeah, we, we, are, we are not there yet. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's probably kind of similar comments that I've already shared, I guess, maybe from the student services, support services side, you know, I think you know, a lot of uh, places that we've worked with are still using very traditional kind of models for uh, providing these services. So faculty might send an email to somebody, I'm concerned about this student. Uh, they kind of then reach out in various kind of 
more manual ways. I think one of the things that they really see as a value in this kind of technology is, is the whole platform that I talked about earlier. So, you know, an alert can still come from the instructor, but now it can be automated and kind of also be looking at things that maybe human beings might not be thinking about so much as triggers to reach out to the student. That goes into uh, an intervention system or, or case management kind of system like Student Success Plan, and there they can access the whole student's profile and, and, and know, okay, this is an adult student uh, working full time, a single parent, uh, and and be able to reach out to them and provide some intervention and assistance, but in the context of understanding that student's needs. And I think those are the types of things I hear a lot from the service side. Of uh, it just becomes this kind of huge evolutionary leap for them in terms of the ability to target their limited resources on students and uh, and help them be successful in ways that just wasn't possible without this kind of technology. Thank you, Josh. Um, I do see that we have a few people typing, so hopefully we'll, we'll let them finish their thoughts and submit. Kate, I have a little update maybe quick here, because I just actually this morning, I apologize for this, Educause accidentally flip-flopped two of my sessions that are similar to each other, and I just heard from them today that uh, they've, they've realized that they made a mistake. So the, the, the date and time of the session that you put up is actually for a different <laughs> session. Oh. I apologize. Um, but I do have that information that I can send. If you want to share screens, I can, sh I can pull that up for people. Sure. Um, or we can just make sure that we get it updated in the slide deck before we send it out. Better plan, for sure. So, but Yeah, it, let's, it's let's do that. And feel free to paste. Yeah, feel free to paste the new time and date in the chat if you want to, if people want to jot that down. But we'll make sure that the slide gets updated so the right Thanks, information is out there. For the Thank you. Nope, no worries. Um, great. So Paul, Paul just um, contributes a little bit more context around some of his, his questions where he says that they're interested in incorporating co-curricular data, uh, participation in clubs, et cetera, into such a model in student affairs here. Um, Josh or, or Lou, is that something that you had have considered? Um, go on, Josh. Well, I, it's absolutely something that we're very interested in and in, in doing work. And I would say, <coughs> excuse me, more of the, uh, <coughs> excuse me, the uh, kind of research area right now. Uh, there's a lot of prior research. Uh, Tinto is a big name in this space in terms of academic support that really shows that non-academic um, indicators like participation in clubs and sports is a proxy for how engaged students are at their institution. And generally, the more engaged the student is, the more likely they're going to have help-seeking behavior to reach out and get help with something. So we have a lot of data here at Marist around participation in community service and, and things of that nature. And we're actually right now actively bringing that data together to kind of take a look at it. I don't know of other research there. There might be. But yeah, it's uh, that kind of, of data that's, uh, that's not just about grades and stuff, I think, is extremely valuable. Yeah, and I, I think that. Uh I, I would certainly ag agree to that. I think that uh, there's a ton of data that we probably should be mining of, about these students from how they're doing in the class all the way through, you know, whether they're going to the gym or not. And um, and I, I see us getting there eventually. <laughs> right now on campus, I'll be very happy when I have a number for each student in each class, that, that will be a big first step. And then hopefully that will uh, prime the pump even more. As long as they're not tracking uh, staff and how frequently we go to the gym, I'm totally fine with that. <laughs> <laughs> I hear you. Um, Josh, in your, uh, in your research, had any model around academic misconduct or fraud come up? Uh, we didn't look at that specifically. It, it's definitely a topic, I would say, in the learning analytics research area. Obviously, you could look at things like turnitin.com, which is probably you know a, an example of, of kind of that space. Uh, there are people that are looking at um, doing really advanced analytics on things like discussion posts and actually trying to find outliers where someone's uh, discussion post might not represent their normal kind of um, stuff, and I know that, that there are MOOC providers that have done research around what's called keyboard cadence, so 
the, uh, the, the actual cadence of each individual person's typing on the keyboard is actually almost like a fingerprint, and it's very hard to fake. So it's a way of kind of determining if the person typing something in is actually the person that signed up for the course. So there are things like that happening. Uh, we've not looked at it specifically here, but, uh, but there is R&D kind of happening in that area that I'm, you know, that's what I'm aware of at least. Great, thank you. Um, Jennifer asks about the, the feedback loops that were built in for students and faculty. So she says, having experience with this in the past, the faculty participation in the system was dependent on their perceived engagement in campus follow-up. And it sounds here like the system automates the alert, but wondering how the follow-up was processed. So uh, obviously, Lou, for you, this is a bit speculative. I don't know if you want right. to talk about um, whether you have some thoughts around that or um, Josh, anything that you can share from, from the research. I mean, I do. I do have thoughts, um, and, and you're right, it is at this point speculative for us. I, I think that it's a, it's a delicate balance because you, you, want, you want a student to get the benefit of a system like this regardless of who their faculty is, and if it were just left to faculty uh, participation, that may or may not be the case. Uh, frankly, I feel like if the class isn't just overly huge, um, faculty could probably tell who's at risk just by seeing their participation in class. But again, that doesn't happen nearly enough and, and, and certainly not in any standardized way. So I think that um, while it's great to get the faculty involved, should they want to be engaged, I think that there has to be a, a fallback to, to their uh, academic advisor or somebody else that's making sure that they know that help's available. Yeah, I was just saying, I think, you know, as Louis guy said, I think the context matters a great deal in my mind as to whether or not things are completely automated or if there's a human involved. Uh, in our study, we definitely had the instructor be kind of the final person that looked at the outcome of the predictive model and then decided, am I going to deploy an intervention or not? Um, and one of the factors there was this is, remained a, at the time was very new stuff. And you can imagine a circumstance where maybe because of some quiz grades, a student has uh, plummeted all of a sudden and uh, therefore gets an alert. But it might be because... Uh, you know, their, their parents were in a car, well, terrible car accident uh, last week, and they're really having a difficult emotional time. And in that scenario, the last thing they really need is some automated email that's going to freak yep. them out about their grades, yep. uh, whereas the instructor might have a better sense of that kind of thing. So that, that's the type of issue that maybe more on the, the policy side, you know, is something that we consider carefully. Yeah, and I'll, I'll add that I think that I don't, I'm – Maybe it's because I'm at a fairly large school. We we have relatively heavy resourcing in in the areas of you know uh, um, uh, advisors and 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 counselors and such on campus. The the biggest challenge is that they're they're trying to affect change with a shotgun approach, and and they may or may not be targeted at the right people, to extend the metaphor a little bit further, I think that if we can help target them at the appropriate clientele, I think we have the resources in place to really be helpful. It's just that right now they're trying to you know, connect with way too many students, and a lot of them just don't need the help. Thank you, Lou. And I was just waiting to see if Jennifer wanted to respond yeah. specifically to that. Um, meanwhile, Lou's posted some updated information in the chat about the, the EDUCOS session. And again, we'll, we'll get that updated before we distribute the recording. Maybe I'll fill some dead air time by saying that the other session actually is about a, uh, a lengthy report on predictive learning analytics that uh, the EDUCOS uh, working group on learning analytics that I'm co-chairing with uh, Kim Arnold from University of Wisconsin is uh, about to publish very soon here. And I just note that because a lot of the issues that are coming up in questions are, are kind of addressed or we, we attempt to address them in that report. So it might be something to keep your eyes out for. Well, you know, if we're, if we're going to be plugging stuff, I, I will say that there's another another NC State talk at, at Educause by by one of my programmers and a, and a few other people about a a very interesting gamification module that they've built for Moodle to to help gamify your course. Uh, I know it's slightly off topic, but it's it's also you know very interesting use of technology. Although Lou, we should think about bringing data in from that. So, I, I, well, absolutely, absolutely. Uh -huh. 
Great. So Jennifer gave us a little bit of extra information here, um, looking at incorporating intention to graduate or intention to complete into the predictive yeah. models. Um, was that a component of, of what was looked at for you guys? No, uh, and I think just the kind of uh, a higher level or kind of stepping away from the specific question, uh, you know, learning analytics, I, I personally think, is, is really in its very early stages still. And so uh, all the questions being asked are great ones. These are ones being asked by researchers in the field, which is one of the why, reasons why collaborations between, let's say, the Aperio Open Source Software Group and, and groups like SOLAR, the Society for Learning Analytics and Research, which, uh, which is the, the group behind the LAC conference I mentioned, and I think is a great combination because it allows us to, to understand what's coming out of the research area and, and then you know build software around that. Uh, but to more answer the question, um, there's work at University of Michigan that I know has been in this space where they've done um, some really interesting stuff doing very extensive uh, surveying of students before, let's say, introductory physics courses. And they use that to understand students maybe not so much intention, but, but attitude towards and, and intention to kind of succeed in that physics course. So you get everything from pre-med students who don't have many concerns to students who have math phobias, and that's you know a, a real issue as they go into that course, uh, which is often a gateway course for, for them to go on to, let's say, STEM uh, field. So, so there is definitely work that's looked at you know, generally using survey data to combine that with this other kind of data to predict the models to really understand that kind of intention or you know more of the emotional state, I'll say, of the student, rather than hard data like you know a, a high school GPA. Yeah, no, I, and I I totally agree with with you, Josh, and and I feel like we're we're so so far just t at the tip of the iceberg. If I when I when I look at what Amazon and Google and all those people do to me when I look something up on the web and, and it's, it's all of a sudden in AdSense everywhere I look. Um, it's kind of amazing what can be done with data analytics. And and right now I think we're we're taking baby steps and we're just focused on the numbers that we have sitting in front of us that are very easy for us to get. And I think that once we get past that, man, there's just there's just tons of other numbers still on campus, even before you get to the soft stuff, that, weren't, that, that are in different places on campus. And if I can get a hold of that data, that's going to make it even better. And then we start looking at the soft stuff as well. It's, it's just unfathomable, I think, the amount of data we could be collecting. Great. So I don't see any additional questions here. Um, so if we don't have others, then we can go ahead and, and wrap up. Um, thank you all so much for your participation and for the great questions. We will distribute the recording of the webinar so that um, folks can look at more detail. Um, if you do have follow-up questions, we've posted some email addresses here, so you're welcome to reach out directly. Uh, hit us up at Educause, or um, there's a, a number of different ways to get a hold of folks. Join Aperio, participate in those calls, newsletter, etc. Um, so thanks again for your participation here, and thank you again, Lou and Josh, for taking the time today to present. And thanks to you, Kate, and for Unicon for helping get that. Absolutely. Yeah, thanks for all the organizations. Fabulous. All right. Thanks, guys.